Thank you so much for being here. Happy to do it. We're thrilled to have you today. Obviously, a lot of excitement here. Let's just take a quick poll. Uh, how many of you use Uber? Okay, that's like 100%. How I'm going to clap for you. Thank you. Use Uber, used Uber this week? Right, like that's like nice. 80, 90. So this feels like what our professors are talking about when it. they are teaching us about product market fit. Now, how many of you have used Uber Pool? Wow, pretty that's good. 75? Right. Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah, good. It's great. Pretty good. So we have so much to talk about today. I would love to start you know, with Iran, but then eventually move on to IAC, Allen & Co., Expedia, Uber. Sounds great. Great. So starting from the beginning, um, your family was 7,500 miles away from here in the Bay Area mm -hmm. in Iran, and that's where you grew up. They were running a hugely successful conglomerate. Yes. In 1978, you ended up having to flee, eventually seeking asylum here in the United States. Yeah. When you got here, you didn't speak fluent English. Sometimes no. you introduce yourself as Darren Kay instead of Dara Khosrowshahi. Those were dark days, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did the challenge of assimilation shape you as a leader? Uh, so I think, first of all, I was a, I was a kid. I was nine years old. Right. And, and I think that um, children, as you know, are much more flexible, and they can ass uh, assimilate much more easily into any situation, different situations. But I, I was also, I was also the, the youngest brother, and I was one of the younger cousins in the family. So I was very, very low on the totem pole, and I had to assimilate even before I came to the States. <laughs> uh, whatever was going on, I had no, no say in the matter. Um, and coming to the States for us, what we had was we always had family. And that was a constant and, and is a constant for me uh, in that really I, I certainly was thrown into a new environment, but I, was, I always had the protection of family to come home to. Uh, we were very lucky to have a very strong education in Iran, and we continue to have a strong education uh, in the US. Um, I learned a lesson that if you don't understand what someone is saying, uh, the answer is no, not yes. Because when, whenever it's an Iranian thing, you always want to say yes. So I'd have no idea what someone was saying. I'd be like, yes, yes. And then I'd be like playing football someplace, having no idea how to catch a ball. Um, but, but, you know, we, we, for me, the assimilation that really got us in was through sports. Uh, and uh, we played soccer was kind of the, the game of the world uh, and not so popular in the U.S. So we were regarded as soccer gods at my high school. Uh, and, uh, and that's how we got to know a lot of other kids and, and really assimilated into the school. Do you keep up with sports? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm a, I'm a, of course, I'm a big premiership soccer fan. So that's my, I wake up at 5.30 in the morning. My wife says I'm crazy, but she's good with it. <laughs> so it's hard to know your personal identity. You came here as a child, and you found your way. It's also hard to know your professional identity. Yeah. And um, you know, when you were at Allen and Company, you met Barry Diller. Yes. And yes. he has a reputation where some comment that he is demanding but loyal. You identified him as someone you wanted as a mentor. How did you know that? And what advice can you give us on cultivating mentorship? Yeah, sure. I mean, he was uh, um, he, he was my first true mentor, uh, and. And the way that I met him at Allen Company, we were, uh, I was a young analyst uh, working on a deal. This was um, a hostile tender offer that Barry had launched for Paramount Pictures. He was running QVC. Um, there was a deal for Viacom, which was a big conglomerate, is a, is a big conglomerate, to buy Paramount Pictures. Uh, and Barry was really interested in the, in the combination of commerce and entertainment. Uh, and when that, when Paramount became in play, he went after it, and I was an analyst on the deal. Uh, and he's like this giant Hollywood mogul, and, and th this was a really dramatic offer where we were making bids, and then they'd make bids, et cetera. It was a very competitive public uh, battle for control of this highly strategic asset at the time. And, and, the, and the thing that I remember about Barry is, Somehow he found out, and you know, he would deal with an SVP who had a VP, an associate, and somehow he found out that I was running the deal model. And, that was this, and I was on the trading floor, just this nobody. 
and he found out that I was running the deal model, and he comes up to me, he's like, you're, you're the one running the deal model, right? Yes, Mr. Diller. Uh, and he's like, okay, I want you to explain to me exactly how it works. Uh, and I said, when? He said, right now. And of course, when Barry Diller says right now, you say, okay. Uh, so I sat down with him, and he wanted to know everything about the deal model from the person who had actually built it. Uh, and he took the time, and, and, and I learned, as I got to know Barry, that one of the things that he really believes in is going to the source. That every time you get information that is filtered, you lose fidelity in the information. Uh, and this was a really important deal for him. Uh, and he, instead of being comfortable with someone who would present information to him in a perfectly clean and comfortable way, he wanted to be uncomfortable with an unknown, but knowing that he'd be closer to the truth. Uh, and that was how our relationship started. And, and he would like come to me on the deal model, are we bidding too much, are we bidding too little? He was making the decisions, but he really wanted to go to the source and, and understand kind of the core of the subject matter. Uh, we lost that battle. Um, and I still remember his, uh, he, he, he released a statement saying, uh, we lost, they won, next. You know, and when I read that thing, I'm like, I want to be a part of next. Uh, so with that, he um, went after, he, we, we went after a bunch of other deals and machinations. Uh, and when the predecessor company to IAC was born, it was Home Shopping Network at the time. He sold QVC, took control of Home Shopping Network. Uh, we closed on a very large deal to buy an entertainment business, uh, Universal Television. And at that point, he said, well, I want you to work exclusively, exclusively, exclusively as my deal person. Um, I said, I can't do that. I've got a portfolio. He said, I want, I want your portfolio to be me. Uh, and I said, well, then give me a job. And he said, let's go. So that's when I, I jumped on board with him. And, and the, the one lesson that I learned from Allen and Company, Herbert Allen was the, is, uh, was the CEO at the time. He always said that as an investor, he didn't bet on companies, he bet on people. You know, he just said, bet on people, I make my bet on people. And I think one lesson for me that I took away was, I was an investor, I was an employee, right? But instead of making a bet on the job, or instead of making a bet on the company, I was making a bet on a person. And I said, you know, Barry Diller, this is a person that I want to work with. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And I followed him, and it was, you know, it's been a great decision in my life. He eventually sponsored you. And, yes, very much so. And tapped you to be the CEO of Expedia. Yeah. And this yeah. is 14 years out of college. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> um, must have been desperate. Well, you proved yourself, right? Yes, yes. Um, at Expedia, you grew the business from two to $10 billion over 13 years. Mm -hmm. It's very impressive. At the same time, your competitor, Priceline, they, they were a distant competitor yeah. at the time you started being CEO. Yeah. And then eventually actually became the leader in yes. the online travel agency space. It's very painful even to hear you say it, yes. <laughs> They grew to four times yes. the size of Expedia not to, uh, when, when you left. God, <laughs> twist it in. Jesus. All right, so you had so many successes. Yes. I'm curious you know, what you think your key wins were and what you would have done differently. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, Booking.com since, or Price, well, it's now Booking Group uh, since you brought it up. This was a company that we looked at um, and, and Expedia was one of the big players in the travel industry that was growing incredibly quickly. Uh, and we were taking on kind of the offline travel agents and the, and the, and the traditional players. Um, and what we saw with Booking.com was a player who had very, very low margins. Uh, and what prevented us from ultimately competing with them the way that we should have uh, was that we didn't want to give up our own fat margins, you know, to be frank. Uh, and it goes to the whole issue of the innovator's dilemma. Uh, we saw this business, and listen, we had an opportunity to buy them just like Priceline actually bought Booking.com. And Booking.com became 
95% of the business and they renamed the businessbooking.com. We had the same opportunity to buy that company. But in looking at that company, our team kind of poo-pooed it because it was a less, uh, the unit economics of that model didn't look as good. And instead of looking at that as an asset, our team looked at it as a liability. Uh, and for me, that's a very important lesson in that it's, it's much easier for a business to make all the tough de decisions and shape their business based on low economics and low margins and then expand. Um, and the expansion is inevitably faster if you have a low price product, especially in the internet world where you know, price is something that is easily discoverable. Um, it's much easier to go from low margin and expand than be the high margin uh, player and then slowly bring your margin down. Um, we did bring our margin down over a long period of time, but if I had to do something quicker, I would have done it. I would have taken the pain up front. I would have done it faster. Uh, and I think that for us as a company, when we started taking that margin pain and when we started really rethinking our business, uh, not as a travel company, but as a technology company, that was the turn that Expedia had to go through uh, to create value for us. But it's absolutely a less, lesson learned, which is you know, low margins are an asset. They're not a liability. Um, and, and to lose that cost discipline ultimately is going to cost you uh, market share over the long term. When did you realize that? And, when, and when, how, how quickly did you adapt at Expedia? Um, you know, we, we realized it actually pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, and, and the issue was that we had to go from a situation where a transaction was worth, call it, 25% to 15%. So we had to essentially engineer 40% of our, of our revenues out of the model. Uh, and that was a process that took us, uh, it took us a couple of years to realize, and then we started engineering it uh, over a period of two or three years. Uh, what allowed us to engineer it was really making the bet on uh, our core technology platforms. Uh, and for me, one of the toughest things that I went through at Expedia was that uh, Expedia was a holding company, number of different brands within the holding company, uh, and the largest part of the business was Expedia.com, a flagship, full-service online travel agency. Uh, and I had failed twice in finding a leader for that business. Uh, Found a person, didn't work out. Brought on another person, didn't work out. Uh, and this was a particularly tough time for me and the board. And I went to the board and Barry. I said, well, I've got to bring in another person. If I'm 0 for 3, I think you should fire me. Uh, Barry said, you're damn right. Uh, so I said, well, then my third pick is going to be me. I don't understand what it takes to run this business. Uh, I've, and the only way I'll understand is if I run it for a while. So I, I was the CEO of the corporate parent, and then I was, I was the CEO, the operational CEO of Expedia.com. Uh, and I learned more during those four or five years when I ran Expedia.com than I ever learned in my life. Uh, and I learned what it really means to operate a company. I learned what it really means for business and technology to come, to come together, um, to really take risks, to really accelerate the rate of innovation within a company operationally. Um, and once we started turning Expedia.com around, the company overall started turning around, and I was lucky enough then to hand that business off to the CTO of Expedia.com at the time, who's still running that business. So that was the real big turn, and, and for me, it was a great learning opportunity. And I, will, I, I know I would not be in the spot had I not made the mistake of not being able to find the right person to run Expedia.com. Moving on from Expedia, which From that painful uh, <laughs> loss to booking, thank you. Well, it, it's a win in the end, right? Two to ten. Yes. Um, so in August 2017, not yeah. too long ago, the Uber board selected you to be their CEO. Yes, yes. And I would presume that each of you, the board and yourself, had requests of each other. Reportedly, Barry Diller helped you during this three-week negotiation Very much process. So. Yeah. Um, you know, what well, it wasn't a negotiation process. It was an interview process, really. OK. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'm curious about either way. We can talk about the negotiation mm -hmm. or the interview. Um, but I'm most curious about the negotiation. And if you can offer us any advice on negotiating job offers, although on a much smaller scale. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. Um, 
So one of the advantages that, that I had in, uh, in approaching this role was that I had a great job already. And I love what I was doing uh, at, at Expedia. And I really wasn't looking to, to jump ship. Uh, and it was both part of the interview process and the negotiation process where, you know, during the interview process, I was just dead honest about what I brought to the table uh, and, and what I thought I needed in order to succeed at the company. Uh, and I still remember it was a, there was the various candidates and, and there were other candidates who were much better known than, you know, they're like capital letters candidates. They came in and presented to the board. Uh, and, and I made a presentation to the board where I talked about my expectations of the board. Uh, and part of the expectations for the board were, you know, what happens in the boardroom stays in the boardroom, doesn't get tweeted out someplace, right? Um, and also that uh, with, with the founders of the company being very much a part of the company spirit and culture and what built that company, if they really wanted a new leader of that company, they needed, it needed to be very clear who the leader was. Uh, and that I expected the board to be there for me, um, but uh, I needed the freedom to maneuver appropriately and make changes that I felt needed to be made quickly because this was a tough situation. Um, so I was very straight with the board about those issues and I remember one of the board members after the meeting said, you know, all of it was great, but that, that page was really, it was not, not such a great, it was not that well received by the board. I said, well, if it wasn't that well received, then I'm glad because this is important to me. Uh, and for whatever reason, you know, maybe they ignored that page. But I, I, I just think that when, when you get into a situation um, in a new opportunity or, your, or a new opportunity that, that presents itself, you know, being transparent about your own capabilities uh, and, and I think you've got to go first. Um, and hopefully then getting the transparency back from, from the other party that you're talking about, ultimately it's a win-win because you never want to get yourself in a position where, um, uh, where you're at the wrong job, you don't have the capabilities, et cetera. Uh, and, and vice versa, you know, it's a, it's a loss for both parties. So I've taken this, you know, one thing that I've learned from Barry is, is he's just the most transparent person on earth. He just lays it out there. Um, I think you, you, Diane von Furstenberg was here and, you know, I hear she was pretty transparent about a lot of things. Um, <laughs> it's just, it, it's, it's part of that, that core culture that, that he taught me. Um, it's something that I took to that board. We had some very frank discussions about expectations both ways. And it's something that since I've taken to the company, um, I think in the second town hall that we had as a company, I actually took my board presentation and I presented it at the all hands. I said, this is me. This is actually what I talked to the board about. And it's the same deck. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is what you're going to get with me. And then we go on from there. That it is tough. It was a tough decision. Yeah, to, very much to so. move to Uber from Expedia. Yeah. You had a clear idea of what you wanted. Um, in one of one of our most sought after classes here at the GSB, called Leadership Perspectives with Joel Peterson and Charles O'Reilly, we often ask visiting leaders what winning is to them. Um, you know, you traded the top job at Expedia yeah. where you were very happy and just doing tremendous things for this job at Uber, which some in the press described as a lose-lose situation. I obviously what? wasn't reading that press, but okay. <laughs> um, ultimately, what, what, what is winning to you? How did you think about that? Um, honestly, I wasn't thinking about winning. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll relate one story, which, which was a funny story. When, when I was first reached out for the, for the job I, by, by some headhunters, I, I said, no way. I was happy where I was. And, um, and then I, I was having a, a drink with a friend of mine, actually the, uh, Daniel Eck, the, the CEO of Spotify, at a conference. And he asked me, he said, have they reached out to you? Because I told them I think you'd be perfect for this role. I said, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm doing great at Expedia. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not going to, why would I ever do that? And he looks at me and he says, Dara, since when is life about happiness? <laughs> <laughs> it 
and he stared at me with his Scandinavian eyes. And he, and, uh, he said, it's about doing something great. Uh, and my wife was there, Sid was there as well. And, and she's like, come on, man, let's, you should go for this. So between those two, that was kind of the moment that, that changed for me. And, and listen, there, there, are, there are very few times in your life when uh, you can change the world uh, or you can change something that's truly important. And, and for me, the advice that I always give folks that I talk to as far as careers is, I think that people often optimize way too much for the role or the company, et cetera. The first thing that I was optimized for is, who are you gonna work with? Uh, and the people that I met on that board, even though there were questions about the board, they were excellent, uh, the, the folks that I talked to on, on the board. And the second is, and the second and third are, can you go to a place where you personally can make a difference? And can you go to a place that's making a difference? Uh, you know, I was in investment banking where I was making a difference, but I didn't feel like the impact on the world was quite there. Uh, and this Uber opportunity for me was, this is an extraordinary opportunity to make an impact at a company that's making an impact in the world. And my attitude was, it's not about winning or losing, it's actually about taking a shot. Uh, and, you know, if, if I took a shot and I won, then glory come upon me or, or whatever it is. But even if I took a shot and I failed and I don't plan to fail, I took that freaking shot. And, you know, when I'm 30 years from now, 40 years from now, I'm going to have a great, great story to tell my kids and their kids. Um, that, to me, is a definition of winning. Like, like winning is getting in the game, is, is playing the game. Um, and for me, a big part of winning is winning as a team. Like, I don't want to win alone. It's so much more fun to celebrate with teammates. It's so much more fun to celebrate as a, as a tribe, as a family. Um, so me is, you know, for me winning is, I'm playing in a game, and it's a really important game, and I've got a team around me, and if we win, it's gonna be a great story. One of the central tenets you mentioned was going to a place where you can have impact. Yeah. To be sure, there was a lot to do at Uber mm -hmm. when you came on. And in particular, Uber has gone through hell because of accusations around Me Too, unprofessional management, safety issues. Yeah, the deserve it in some. The culture was thought to over-index on this culture of begging forgiveness versus asking permission. How did you address that specifically, and what's left to do? So I think, first of all, the um, I don't know if the company, well, I kind of know that, that the company wouldn't have succeeded and been in that position in the first place without that culture. So I know that it's very easy to criticize it after the fact, et cetera, but the fact is that there are very few companies that have created the kind of brand and the kind of service that that team created, you know, the world. It was historic. It is historic. It will be historic. But the one thing that I've learned is that success imprints much more forcefully than failure. Uh, and what the pattern that you see with companies is that anytime you have a success, of course it's because of you and everything that you do and your culture, et cetera. And if there's a failure, oh, it was a, it's the market or the market wasn't right, timing wasn't right, it's always someone else. So success sometimes and the kind of success that Uber had was so extraordinary that actually in hindsight, it kind of made sense that the success was born out of you know, aggression and going for it and not taking no for an answer and, and, and running through doors. Uh, and it worked and it worked spectacularly, it, but, but that hid some negatives and some very significant negatives that were forming as a result of that culture. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, I haven't experienced the kind of success that Uber experienced early on. I don't know if I would have seen it because they're too, too busy winning. And they're too busy being on the photo spread of a magazine talking about how they're changing the world and how they can do no wrong. So, you know, I, I, I want to be careful about how we think about this situation. Where we wound up was that once the winning stopped, you know, the fall was really, really tough. And it happened suddenly. And I think the company hadn't built the, the bulwark and the framework to be able to resist that kind of the wall that they hit. Um, and they needed a change. And, and you know, I'm here, and I can be a, a part of that change. 
Um, that said, what we wound up with was a culture that was, I think, um, uh, not diverse enough. There was one way, and there was the only the, the, the way that was defined kind of as, as a Uber way. The company had not taken the time to think about diversity of thought, um, diversity of origin, gender diversity, um, uh, um, thinking about uh, underrepresented minorities and their position at, at the company. Um, I think that the company was a little bit too top down, you know, and, and it's part of the power of a founder led company, but it can also be part of the weakness of a founder led company. Um, and I think these are all actions that we're taking. You know, this is a company, we are truly a global company. The connection that we have with the cities that we operate in, we're not just a digital company. The connection that we have with the cities that we operate in are physical and are fundamental. When our payment system goes down, we have drivers who don't get paid, and some of them need to get paid in order to afford dinner that night. Uh, so the connection that we have with the cities, with our driver partners, with our riders, are so fundamental and so important that it's incredibly important as we develop as a company to be as diverse as the business, the riders and the drivers that we're serving. To be diverse in our views, in our international viewpoints, et cetera. And we are working very hard in bringing a leadership team that values that diversity and then pushing down the culture of truly celebrating differences, um, truly being at one and in service of the cities in which we operate. But it's a journey, it's only been a year and it's a start, but it's something that I and I think our leadership team are incredibly passionate about. And the opportunity for us is, you know, I think there's this dislocation between technology companies and the rest of the world, and it's coming out in a lot of ways. We're not the only tech company. We're, to some extent, the tip of the sphere, uh, the sphere here. But I think as a technology company, we touch people in a way that other tech companies don't. It's fundamental, I think we're in touch in the cities in which we operate, so I think we can, we as Uber, have the opportunity to be that next generation technology leader, both in terms of culture, but actually how we connect to the cities uh, and, and the constituencies that, that, we, that we work with and operate around. So it's a big job, but I'm psyched for it. What is, what's one specific example of a seed that you're sowing right now that that could actually ultimately look like what you're describing as an ideal stunt. Well, state. I think you know we're, we're thinking about our driver partners. We've always called our driver partners partners, but I don't think we've um, treated them as such in the past. Uh, so now, when we are launching our product, the the driver app, we actually go to our driver partners. We do the research with them. We, uh, for the first time, really, we got driver partner beta testers and go out there and we actually build not what we think they should have, but actually what they're telling us they should have as well. Um, so that's, it's, it's just a very different way of building product than, than we've had in the past. Um, one of the areas where we're thinking about for our driver partners is our insurance, right? It's what if they get into accident, paternity, maternity leave, et cetera. Uh, and we have partnered with, a, with AXA uh, in Europe to actually provide these kinds of insurance coverages for our driver partners. And it's something that's been incredibly well received. So that, you know, that might not have been a direction that uh, old Uber would have gone through, but I think that a more mature Uber, uh, an Uber that understands that our driver partners in many ways are the face of the company, that's an area that we invest in. And I think more and more we're looking to treat them as the true partners that they are. Look at the external side of the house. There's a lot that you've been doing internally, and you mentioned that another one of your tenants is going to a place that actually can have an impact. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Uber has shown and demonstrated that potential. A former high-ranking Google executive recently said to The New Yorker that, quote, everyone is terrified of Uber. Your Who is that person? Anonymous in The New Yorker. <laughs> so. Um, your competition is gunning for you. Yes, of course. And uh, one of our beloved lecturers here, Rob Siegel, often asks and popularized the following question to visiting executives. You have one silver bullet to take out a competitor. Who is it? Wow. <laughs> that is a tough one, a silver bullet to take out a competitor. Um, you know, might be a pink competitor, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> 
You know, I, I honestly think that right now, um, the, I actually do very much believe that companies that are too competitor focused uh, sometimes and many times stop caring about what's important, which is the customer. Uh, so if there's a silver bullet for us, it's actually um, really starting. And, and I think Uber, we have been to some extent historically too guilty of, of competitors and what they're doing and share, et cetera. Um, we are now really, our operations teams and our product teams and our technology teams are working together in a way that is customer obsessed. Uh, and the, our customers are the riders and the drivers. And, and that is, you know, if there's a silver bullet, I don't want to shoot it at the competitor. I actually want us to accelerate this kind of new customer obsession as a company. Um, because ultimately, whether we win or lose, it ain't going to be about what the competitors do. It's, it's, it's about what we do. You know, we have, we have a global scope. None of our competitors have a global scope. We are multi-product. We've got a rides business that is enormous and growing very quickly. We have an incredible new business growing uh, with Eats. We are getting to scooters and bikes. We're getting into VTOLs, vertical takeoff and landing uh, product. We're getting into freight, et cetera. The definition of success, we, we're taking out so many competitors that I need a silver shooting machine gun to take out my competitors, <laughs> right? So it's really, we've got to be focused internally in order to win. That's, that's the real focus for us. Lots of product lines. And on top of that, you're planning on going public next year. Yes. How do you, we talked about this a little bit, and specifically in the context of Uber, how do you trade off investing in growth, R&D, new products, uh, with demonstrating predictable profitability to shareholders? Um, we're not going to have predictable profitability. And we'll say it to our shareholders. And the shareholders can choose. If they want a predictably profitable company, go buy a bank. Don't come to us. Simple. I noticed when you were describing your. <laughs> no, it's just, I'd rather be truthful. I can't wait for your shareholder letter. <laughs> hey, I did have, when I was, when I was at Expedia, I, I had a, I still remember, an investor meeting um, with, with an investor, and uh, he talked for like five minutes about being a long-term investor. We're a long-term investor. We're going to be an owner with you, et cetera. I'm like, so what's your average holding period? And he looked at me in like, with those deep eyes, and he said, nine months. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. So it, it's just you, you've got to, um, there are true long-term investors, uh, but just like you can't be too competitor focused, just focus on the product, state who you are. Uh, and, and that comes with limits, and I think you will get investors that you deserve, and the markets that we're going after are so big, and the position that we have is unique, and by the way, we have lots of tough, tough competition that we will find investors who hopefully agree with us that, 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 that really the long term is what we're after. And, and, and kind of what, what I like to talk to, to my team about is we, uh, I'm actually um, short term impatient. You know, I want the small ideas that take a week and I'm long term patient. I'll take the big ideas that take five years. I don't like the in between. Uh, and so if there's a small idea, get it to me, get it, get it launched in a month, get a launch in two weeks, I'll take that, I'll take the big long-term bets, don't come to me with in between. One thing when you were describing kind of the product suite that you're most focused about that I noticed is that you did not mention autonomous vehicles. That's part of the rideshare business. I think, I think that with autonomous, what's different about us yeah. uh, as it relates to um, other companies out there is Autonomous is not a means to an end. Now, autonomous technology is going to be incredibly exciting in terms of safety and ultimately cost and providing this service, this transportation and mobility service to everyone everywhere, especially if you don't live in the middle of the city. Um, but I don't believe that autonomous could be commercialized at the giant scale that it has a potential to do so without ride sharing. And I believe that any ride share service that doesn't have autonomous 15 to 20 years from now will exist. So to us, autonomous uh, and rideshare ultimately are going to be one and the same. And the advantage that we have, the magic is that we are able to have them under one roof. And when we develop autonomous, we can develop it for a very small use case. 
uh, which is for, let's say, 1%, by the way, that one, that very small use case is gonna be incredibly difficult, but 1% of routes, then 2% of routes, then 3% of routes. The challenges that we have to take on in commercialization are much, much uh, more simple than the challenges that any autonomous only player. So for us, autonomous and rideshare, they're ultimately gonna be one and the same for us. Do you think on the supply side, eventually Uber might serve as a platform for players right now who are saying they're autonomous only, like Waymo? Oh, very something? much so. Yeah, we, we will uh, we'll welcome all comers. And, and you'll see that now, for example, we have a uh, integration with Lime, uh, who is, they have bikes and scooters out there. We already, I think they are live in Oakland. Uh, so ultimately, the vision that we see of Uber is, we want to be that A to B mobility and transportation platform for people, food, and things. Uh, and no one company can provide all of the different versions of transportation and mobility. We will look to integrate in all other, many, many other third parties, just like Amazon has their own product and third party merchant product. Um, and we want part of that mobility to be hopefully provided by cities, the bus service, uh, metro service, et cetera. We want to have all of that available in Uber so that if you say, I want to get to the city now, uh, what is the best way to, for you to get to the city? And if the best way for you to, is to take Caltrain, you know, we will tell you exactly when it's coming. We'll make payment perfect, uh, and, and, and we will make it predictable as far as you're having real-time data. And hopefully, you know, at some point, we'll introduce um, surge pricing and all the other cool stuff that we do. A lot to do. Yeah. And I want to turn to you now. Uh, you, my understanding is that you've been commuting to the Bay Area from Seattle. I have, the, the commute has officially stopped. Oh, congratulations. Yes, I have moved. Thank you very much. That's fabulous news. Yes. <laughs> Internally at Uber, you are riding the ship while simultaneously preparing for this IPO. You're also managing the pressure of internal leaks. An all-hands meeting was recently leaked just a day or two yes, ago. They'd stop, they, they, the leaks had stopped until yesterday. So. But you are working to repair trust within Uber. Mm -hmm. you know, how, that's a lot of tension. Yeah. How do you maintain your sanity? Who's your support system? <laughs> um, I'd say my wife. You know, she's, uh, I, I, I'd say there, there, there are two elements. One is um, when you come from a family who's lost everything and then rebuilt it, um, it puts a perspective which is, uh, I just kind of don't have a fear of loss anymore because I know I'm going to be okay. Uh, so the leak, did it suck? Yeah. But are things getting better? Much better. Uh, and then when I get home and, you know, I have dinner with my wife and my kids, it's all good. And the next day, I'll do my best. Um, and, and, you know, what I know I always have with me is my family. Um, and what I know... I will be true to is, is really giving everything I have to this opportunity because it is an opportunity of a lifetime. And I'm incredibly lucky to be in this spot. It's, it's interesting because before you came to Uber at Expedia, mm -hmm. you tried to travel to India. Your visa got denied. Yeah. <laughs> but. Apparently, I wasn't a big deal enough. Uber, I got like a visa like that. It was amazing. And not only that, but you were <laughs> meeting with Prime Minister Modi. Yes. And you know, equally, as CEO, you are making deals on an international scale, liaising with governments like the UK. Uh, in a world far after Uber, might we one day see Secretary of State Dara Khosrow Shahi? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would be very fearful for the country in that uh, case. Um, I, uh, you know, I have joked that that. My, my job is half CEO, half politician in this new world, but um, I, 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 uh, I'm busy with all the politics right here. I don't think I want to get into more politics than that. One last question before we let you go. Sure. All right. Um, we're going to do a quick lightning round. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you a prompt. You can respond with a word up to a sentence. Sounds good. All right. Um, Fortnite or World of Warcraft? Oh, World of Warcraft, definitely. Um, I actually tried to have a date with my wife, Sid, in World of Warcraft, and I was this gnome, and you can put in these commands to dance for her. She was a, she was an elf. 
you know, which <laughs> compared to her, you know, I am a known. Um, she didn't think it was that cool, but still. <laughs> Steph or LeBron? Oh, I got to go with Steph. I mean, I'm here. Nine Inch Nails or Radiohead? Radiohead, most definitely. <laughs> I'm a big Radiohead fan. You're the youngest of three brothers, as you said. Yes. Cave Amarad. <laughs> You're really trying, you start with booking.com kicking her ass and then pick between, uh, uh, you know, the proper answer of the young brother is Dara. I'm the youngest too, I can relate. Um, Pike Place Market or Ferry Building Marketplace? I gotta go with Pike Place for now. Gotta love Seattle, that's, you know, it's in the skin. Profits or growth? Growth. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Lyft or taxi cabs? <laughs> <laughs> I will walk before I uh, take a cab. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you.